Hello, and welcome to Campaign Legal Conversations. My name is Brendan Quinn, and I'm Senior Communications Manager for Campaign Finance and Ethics here at Campaign Legal Center. Campaign Legal Center is a national nonpartisan organization working to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Our guest today is UCLA law professor Rick Hassan, whose latest book is titled A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. Professor Hassan is an internationally recognized expert in election law, as well as in the areas of legislation and statutory interpretation, remedies, and torts. He served in 2020 as a CNN election law analyst and as an NBC News MSNBC election law analyst in 2022. He directs UCLA Law's Safeguarding Democracy Project and is the author of over 100 articles on election law issues, published in numerous journals, including the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, and Supreme Court Law Review. His op-eds and commentaries have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Politico, and Slate. He has also received numerous accolades for his previous books, which include The Justice of Contradictions, Antman Scalia and the Politics of Disruption, and also Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. Moderating today's discussion is CLC President Trevor Potter. A Republican former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, Trevor was general counsel to John McCain's 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns and an advisor to the drafters of the McCain-Feingold campaign finance law. The American Bar Association Journal has described Trevor as hands down one of the top lawyers in the country on the delicate intersection of politics, law, and money. Trevor has appeared widely in national broadcast and print media. To many, Trevor has perhaps best known for his recurring appearances on the Colbert Report. As a lawyer for Stephen Colbert's super PAC, Americans for a Better Tomorrow, Tomorrow, throughout the 2012 election. Trevor is also featured in the documentary film Dark Money and Jon Stewart's film Irresistible. Before I turn things over to Trevor, I would like to review a few housekeeping items. First, you can use the comments section on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube to submit your questions. At the end of this discussion, we will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer every question. If we are not able to answer your question today and you are a member of the press, you can email your questions to media at campaignlegal.org. If you are a member of the public and we are not able to get to your question today, please email info at campaignlegal.org. Now I will turn things over to Trevor. Thank you, Brendan. Rick, it's great to have you with us today at Campaign Legal Conversations. Uh, I uh, thought the introduction was quite fair. You're the author of a number of serious books on elections and I appear in the occasional Hollywood film and late night <laughs> television show. Uh, so it's good to be here with you having a serious conversation about your most recent book. So you've written five books, I think, on various aspects of election law and how we vote. And after all of that, you have decided to write a book saying we need a constitutional amendment in order to have a real right to vote. Uh, why do we need this amendment? Well, first, let me thank you, Trevor, and to everyone at the Campaign Legal Center for hosting me yet again. Uh, we've been able to do this with a few of the books. And, and I should say that I would say the introduction was fair because it described you as actually doing real work in the real world and me sitting in my uh, ivory tower, as you can see behind me, uh, uh, writing and, and, and reading and uh, having the luxury of being able to think a little bit bigger about some of these issues. And that actually, uh, I think, is a good segue for me to explain why I, I wrote this book. Uh, I think many people who are watching this conversation, uh, if they're not uh, practicing lawyers, and even if they are, they may not realize that the United States Constitution contains in it no affirmative right to vote. At the time the, the Constitution was uh, enacted and ratified, people couldn't vote for president. That was for the state legislatures to do. People couldn't vote for the U.S. Senate. We didn't get that right until the 17th Amendment in the 20th century. And even for the House, the rules were uh, set for each state to decide the qualifications of voters. And as I argue in the book, 
if we actually had an affirmative right to vote in the Constitution, as opposed to just saying no discrimination on the basis of race or gender or age between 18 and 21, if we actually had an affirmative right to vote, it would promote political equality. It would kind of lower the, the volume of litigation in the voting wars where you are in the trenches, and it would make it harder to steal elections, something that really came to the fore during the 2020 election season. So you say you're in an ivory tower, but you're also very much anchored in the real world. Um, I don't have to tell you that getting uh, two thirds of each house of Congress to propose an amendment and three fourths of the states to pass it uh, is an uphill battle on any subject. I, I think the last one was the 18 year old right to vote. Uh, I may have missed something since, but they tend increasingly either to be very unimportant and non-controversial or not to happen. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment is hanging out there after 30 years or something. Uh, what sh did you write this as an intellectual exercise? Do you think it could actually happen? What, what do you, what's your sense of that? Right. So uh, it does require two thirds of each House of Congress and three quarters of state legislatures to agree. That is a tall order. Uh, the last uh, proposed accepted constitutional amendment was in 1971, you mentioned, the uh, 26th Amendment, which came during the Vietnam War and made sure that people between the ages of 18 and 21 who were being sent off to war could vote for the commander in chief. Uh, the only amendment since that is uh, the amendment in the 27th Amendment, which actually proposed as part of the original Bill of Rights, but only ratified in the 1990s. So um, we've lost as a country our muscle memory when it comes to constitutional amendments. Most Americans, this will make you feel old, Trevor, but I, I looked this statistic up. Most Americans were not born, a majority of Americans, in 1971. Uh, and so, in fact, um, we don't know how to do this. And with our polarized society, it's so hard to even think. You can't even get regular voting rights legislation through Congress now, thanks uh, in part to the increased polarization over these issues, that things are supported only by one party and reposed by the other. Uh, we did get a little bit of fixing of our electoral college rules, uh, in no small part thanks to the efforts of Campaign Legal Center with the passage of the Electoral Count Reform Act. Bigger things uh, that uh, it would... Um, protect voting rights more broadly, they're very hard to do. So why do it? Uh, I think to answer that, I have to go back to one of the stories I tell in the book related to women's suffrage. So back in 1874, there was a woman who was a, uh, a citizen, adult, resident of Missouri named Virginia Minor. She went to the Supreme Court and she said, I am eligible to vote under the Constitution. The, the 14th Amendment, which had recently been ratified, guarantees all citizens the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I'm a citizen. I should be allowed to vote. Uh, Missouri is not letting me vote because I'm a woman. And the Supreme Court said, yes, you're a citizen, but the question of voting is not a right protected by the Constitution. This is a matter of state law. So she lost. That case was Minor versus Hepperset. It was 1874. What happened after that is what's really interesting and, and is uh, my way for answering this question. What happened after that was the women's suffrage movement, which had been kind of all over the place, really started focusing on state by state enfranchisement of women. It was a, a, a movement that took generations. But by the time we got to 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, uh, was passed and ratified, um, over 30 states had changed their state constitutions to allow women to vote, to say no discrimination voting on the basis of gender. Along the way, then, the push for a constitutional amendment paid political dividends. It provided a way to organize around voting rights. Same thing now. Today, we lurch from crisis to crisis. You know, I went on the CLC's litigation page. You've got so many things that you're dealing with. A big part of that is because of how we deal with voting rights in this country. And it doesn't have to be that way. And so this may not be something you or I will see, but maybe the next generation or the generation after that. But rather than be, you know, just being putting out the, the biggest fire, uh, let's also think about, you know, fire prevention over the long term. Do you think that analogy for the right to women to vote ending up 
with 30 states allowing women to vote before you had the federal constitutional right. Is that something that could happen here? Would you foresee states enacting constitutional right to votes um, and, and thus sort of socializing the idea uh, before you, you actually had Congress do something? That's a great question because uh, I think just about every constitution already does have some protection for the right to vote. But the question is, you know, how is it read by courts and how is it implemented? So you may remember back in the, um, I guess it was 2022, the North Carolina Supreme Court said partisan gerrymandering violates the state constitution. Uh, that was a case that ended up going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court called Moore versus Harper. Um, the Supreme Court changed from Democratic control to Republican control, and, and the new majority said, never mind, the state constitution doesn't contain this. Um, and so, you know, if you really want to have a strong set of voting protections, uh, you can't have it be part of the whim of the uh, state Supreme Court. Just like for the federal, on the federal level, we've seen the Supreme Court disappoint us again and again. It's a big theme of my book, A Real Right to Vote, that the Supreme Court has mostly been a laggard rather than a leader on voting rights. So you'd have to amend the Constitution to more muscularly uh, um, protect voting rights in each state. And that's something I would definitely support as a path towards, uh, you know, coming up with a way of getting buy-in from both Democrats and Republicans on protecting uh, the right to vote. And you might think, well, this is an issue that just divides partisans. I'd point out that the Republican Party is changing. The Republican Party is now uh, focusing more on getting poorer voters, uh, less educated voters, you know, the so-called Trump base of the Republican Party. Those people are more likely to be disenfranchised by strict voting laws. And it could well be that there'll be a period of time, may not be now, maybe it's 10 years from now, when it might be in both parties' own self-interest, putting aside the public interest, but in their own party's self-interest to uh, unite behind something like a right to vote amendment. Yeah, I, I do think the changing political environment uh, has, has not yet caught up with the partisan uh, view that the more voters, the better the Democrats do. I was talking recently with someone in Montana about the 2020 election where the Republicans did quite well. And they said, well, that's because it was in the middle of COVID and the state sent out ballots to every registered voter. Uh, and people who would never otherwise bother to vote, i.e. more of the Republican base, actually turned out. So, so that was going to be my follow-up question to you is, do you think at the moment this has a, a, a partisan angle to it? If a member of Congress proposed it, could you get a bipartisan bill? Republicans have generally been skeptical of more voting. What, how do you see that playing out? Right. And I would say that, you know, if you go back to 2020 and the COVID pandemic, and you may remember Donald Trump making repeated false claims that mail-in ballots were uh, going to be a, a pathway to fraud. I think I that, that I think that that, um, you know, he was sh shot himself in the foot because he discouraged people in the middle of a pandemic from voting by mail. And so some people probably just decided can't do it. Or maybe they were sick with COVID and didn't show up at the polling place. I think if he would have actually encouraged voting, he well could have won the 2020 election. So, um, uh, you know, are people going to catch up with it? I, I, I talk about in my book, some uh, social science data indicating that when you look at turnout, it's not really correlated with, you know, the higher turnout elections means Democrats win. So I think eventually people will catch up on this. But you're right that there is this split. So what's in it for the right? Uh, number one, um, uh, the next people who might be disenfranchised might be Republicans. In the book, I tell the story of Herbert Carrington, who was a sergeant in the Army, moved from Alabama to Texas. This is in the 1960s. He went to vote and he wasn't able to vote because the state constitution said uh, no voting by members of the military unless you were already a, a Texas uh, resident before you joined the military. So things change over time. Uh, so you know, political equality protects all of us. Uh, you don't know what the next state's going to do and how that's going to have a partisan impact. Number two, 
Um, for to the extent that Republicans and others care about election integrity, my bill would do more than just uh, guarantee the right to vote in uh, elections. It would also make the registration and identification of voters easier and better. So every state would have to register all eligible voters and go through the costs of doing all that and identify those voters. That means if those voters are lacking birth certificates or whatever, they don't have the right documentation, uh, you know, paying for that documentation to get what is needed. Uh, I don't propose federalizing or nationalizing our elections, even though I think that would probably be a better way to go. But in this country, we have this long history of decentralized elections. So I'm not proposing that in this book. Um, but this would be a kind of system where the federal government would come up with a number. So if you moved from, say, Rhode Island to Montana, your number would go with you. So second thing that this would do is it would promote election integrity. And the third thing it would do is it would make it harder to steal elections. So you may remember this as well, Trevor, when Donald Trump, after the 2020 election, was trying to get state legislatures to put in alternative slates of electors, claiming they had the right to do this. And... Um, under the Electoral Count Act and, and under the 12th Amendment. Uh, well, this whole theory depends on the idea that people don't have the right to vote for president. And as recently as the year 2000, in the Bush versus Gore case, the case that ended the dispute over uh, Florida's electoral votes and whether Bush or Gore was going to be the next president, the Supreme Court reminded us that even though states through their legislature had, has given each voter the right to vote for president. That right could be taken away in future elections at any time through legislation. And so if we had in the constitution a right to vote for president, well, these kind of schemes to try to get legislatures to overturn the will of the people would just be impossible. Even though I think they're very difficult now, they would be completely off the table through explicit language in the constitution. So I take it you are saying in that example that individuals ha would have the right to vote for president, uh, thus knocking out the idea that state legislatures select the electors. But you're not otherwise uh, suggesting changing the electoral college. Is that right? So in the book, um, I divide my proposal into two parts, the basic amendment and then some add-ons. So under the basic amendment, which I think is the one that would be most likely to garner support of some Republicans, I would leave the Electoral College as is. And so, for example, suppose you live in Maryland and Maryland has a certain number of Electoral College votes. Maryland can decide, although it's gonna be winner take all, or they could decide as Maine and Nebraska have, they're gonna use a different system. But however, whatever system they use, if it's district by district or proportional representation or winner take all, it would have to be done by a vote of the people. And so the legislature couldn't do it. And so the results in Maryland would depend upon a popular vote. You wouldn't need to remake the electoral college system at all. In the second part of my book, I talk about some, some more radical changes, changes which I personally support, but I think are more negotiable if we're actually trying to get something that could get some some pass some bipartisan buy-in to actually pass the thing. One of them is getting rid of the Electoral College. One of them is changing the uh, rules for equal representation of states uh, in the U.S. Senate. Uh, one of them is coming up with uh, rules for people who live in United States territories, like uh, Guam, Puerto Rico. Would they have the right to vote for president? And one of them relates to the status of people who have felony convictions who in, I think, eight states uh, continue to be disenfranchised uh, even after they've completed their sentences. So uh, I personally think the Electoral College is not as good as doing a national popular vote, but that's not in the core basic amendment that I'm proposing here. So I want to talk about the core in a moment, but meanwhile, I want to just take one look down a rabbit hole you just opened, uh, which is changing the two senators per state structure that's in the Constitution. Since the Constitution also says that, I believe that's the only piece uh, that cannot be amended to reduce the representation in the Senate. How do you, how do you, what would you suggest that doesn't, that avoids that restriction and yet uh, equalizes by population or, or is better equalizing by population the Senate? 
Right. And just to, to explain the point for why you might want to change it, uh, I live in California. Uh, there are people who live in Wyoming or Rhode Island that have many fewer people than even the county I live in, Los Angeles, and yet they have the same representation in the Senate. And so, uh, you know, you could find a majority of senators in Congress representing 50 million fewer people than, uh, you know, a, another group of senators. Um, but you're right that there's a part of the Constitution, you know, hardwired in because, you know, this was part of the compromise between the slave states and the free states at the time of the Constitution. You can't amend uh, the Constitution to change the equal representation per state for the Senate. So what do I propose? Two amendments. The First Amendment would change that part of the Constitution. Uh, it would say that the, this um, uh, mm -hmm. provision limiting the Senate uh, 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 is, is no longer part of the Constitution. It can't be the dead hand of history that we could never amend the Constitution to change a rule about amending the Constitution. Um, if it did, then you know we're in a lot of trouble and we need to maybe have a constitutional convention, which is something people talk about as an alternative way of trying to deal with the convention, and then deal with amending the Senate. But you're right, that is a rabbit hole, for sure. Yeah, I, I wonder if, I've always wondered this, and I, I have never really done any research on it, but I wonder if you could avoid the, you can't reduce the representation by merely increasing it on the basis of population. So Wyoming still has two senators, but California gets 10. I guess it would depend on what reduce means, whether it right. is a relative or absolute term. And, you know, it'd be much cleaner to just pass a couple of amendments, one getting rid of that and two changing changing that rule. All right. Well, that's a fun rabbit hole, but it's not the center of your proposal. And I would love it if you could explain to everyone who's listening to us now what the amendment, you've explained the uh, benefits of the amendment, but what does it actually say? How do you yes. accomplish this? Right. So I should say that the basic amendment, and you can look in the appendix of a rule right to vote, I have actual proposed language. So it's a little less abstract than just talking about these things. Uh, the actual proposed amendment, the basic one, putting aside those um, add-ons, uh, has six parts. Um, some of it is written in a much more specific way uh, than what you would see in a typical constitutional amendment. So let's take the 15th Amendment. You know, it says Congress uh, has the power to enforce. That's in part two. Part one says uh, um, you can't discriminate in voting on the basis of race. That's all it says. And we know that in 1903, a case called Jackson versus uh, Giles, uh, the Supreme Court refused to do anything about the disenfranchisement of a black man in Alabama. They said, yeah, you know, it violates the Constitution, but nothing we can do about it. So I don't trust the Supreme Court, as I said earlier, in the 235 year history of the Supreme Court, there are only about eight years where the court was leading rather than um, being an impediment to strong voting rights. This was the period of the Warren Court in the 1960s. So part of what I would do is direct the courts in a much more explicit way. And part of what I would do is, is codify in the constitution some of these Warren Court precedents. So, so what would it do? It would require that people have the right, if they're citizen, adult, resident, non-felons, they have the right to vote in all elections in which they, um, are, where they're a resident, including for president, that votes be equally weighted, uh, that when courts evaluate burdens on the right to vote, that they have to um, put a thumb on the scale favoring voters. Uh, let me come back to that one in a second, because that's a really important one. Uh, protection for minority voters under what is today part of the Voting Rights Act, Section 2. I would codify that because I don't think the Supreme Court's doing a very good job with that, and I worry about the future of that. And enhancing Congress's power to protect uh, voting rights. Uh, so the Congress, as it always has, would have ample power to protect voting rights. Uh, the Supreme Court has been kind of wary of Congress's power, most famously in the Shelby County versus Holder case where they killed off a key part of the Voting Rights Act. But let me come back to this idea of balancing burdens. And I want to talk about some litigation that you at the Campaign Legal Center were involved in. I talk about this in the book. So uh, in North Dakota, um, it, we had very close Senate races, um, including uh, with Heidi Heitkamp, who was a Democrat, who was a senator. And she was elected in part with support from Native American voters. Now, in response to... Uh, Heitkamp continuing to win, the North Dakota legislature 
passed a law that said that if you want to vote, North Dakota doesn't have regular voter registration, but they said if you want to vote, you have to show not only ID, you have to show a residential street address. Now, for most voters, that's no big deal. You know, you live at 123 Main Street, you can show something to prove that. But if you are a Native American who is poor, who is living on a reservation where they don't have street addresses, this turned out to be a great impediment. And so it took, I think, three lawsuits, six and a half years before the state of North Dakota agreed to settle this case and find a way to not disenfranchise these voters. At one point, when the courts were not giving any relief, you had tribal leaders having to come up with a system on a reservation to create street addresses and then make new tribal identifications so that people would be able to vote. It was just like a ton of energy being put into a set of rules that were going to disenfranchise eligible voters for no good reason. When the courts looked at this, they applied what's called Anderson verdict balancing, which is essentially a test that the courts use for these election challenges, where they put a huge thumb on the scale favoring the state. The state just gets to say without having to prove this is necessary to prevent fraud, to promote uh, voter confidence, but then the plaintiffs have to prove huge burden. So my amendment would flip that and say, no, states have to come up with a lot more evidence that these laws are actually necessary to put impediments in front of voters. Is there really a fraud problem? Is there really a confidence problem that this would solve? And voters would not face that tremendous burden anymore. Yes, I remember the lawyers getting on the plane and rushing off a couple of days before that election to go to court. And of course, you have to have people who've been injured. So we had plaintiffs uh, who said they couldn't vote and the court held an emergency hearing and they said, okay, we're going to rule in your favor. The 12 plaintiffs, whatever number it was that you've identified, they can vote. But the thousands of other people uh, similarly affected, oh, we'll have to deal with that after the election in a whole separate trial. Right. Uh, so you're right. It was a long slog to, to finally get to the point uh, of making sure those people had a right to vote. Um, you said that you think this would, would, you, would change the burden and therefore do a better job of protecting the right to vote. Um, what, which Supreme Court precedents do you think this would affect and, and is it retroactive? I um, mean, the court has found Section uh, 5 of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional. I take it that stays unconstitutional under this uh, amendment, but uh, what would you see in terms of Supreme Court precedents going the other way because of this amendment? So I think of a case like Shelby County came up again, if Congress passed a new preclearance formula or tried to pass the same preclearance formula that this could then be, you know, because we can't just reopen an old case, uh, but under this new standard, it would be much more likely that the court would uphold uh, a preclearance provision. Um, I think some of the cases that interpret the meaning of Section 2 would be mooted by this new constitutional provision that would include a kind of stronger version of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, the case of Crawford versus Marion County Election Board, which is one of these cases about the balancing of burdens that we were talking about, that's a case that if you go back and look at break bill and these other uh, cases involving Native American voters in North Dakota. These were cases that Crawford that was relied upon. That would be gone. So I think that there, uh, it wouldn't be that the case would be overturned directly, but someone would have to sue and the Supreme Court would have to recognize, I guess the word that would be appear on Lexis or Westlaw would be abrogation, that uh, it was abrogated by the constitutional amendment that this balancing test is now gone it's been replaced with something else under this new 28th amendment or whatever number it might get. I, I love learning new words. I'll have to look up abrogation after this. Yes. Um, you mentioned something about a voter ID number. Uh, tell us about that. What, what, what is it? Why, do, why is it needed? Why would it be useful? So, you know, one of the things I looked at in writing this book is why is our country so different than every other country uh, that's an advanced democracy in having a crisis every time we're holding an election. So every four years, you know, I'm sure this is true for you, Trevor, as well as for me, that the phone starts ringing, like 
about the latest lawsuit, what's going to happen, armies of lawyers, you know, what, what are the rules going to be? I mean, this is just not normal. You know, this is just, uh, you know, and so if you look at how other countries do it, most other countries have national nonpartisan election administration. You know, as you look at Canada or Germany or Australia, uh, we're not going to have that in this country. We're still going to have a decentralized election system. I, I, I've resigned myself to that. Um, but one of the other things that countries do uh, is that they proactively register their voters. So as soon as you turn 18, the, you know, the government of Canada is going to make sure you can vote. And part of what almost every other country has is a national identity card. It's a card that, you know, it's not your passport, but it's a way of you, you know, identifying that you're a citizen of your country. Now, national identity cards are kind of controversial in the United States because they raise issues about immigration, all kinds of other things. Show so, us your papers in yes. the you know, World War II movie. Yeah, so I'm not advocating a national ID card, but I'm advocating some system of uh, with a number that could be used to identify voters. And in order to, while the states are going through this process of making sure that all eligible voters are uh, registered, they're going to be in um, uh, cooperation with the federal government of assigning them a unique voter identification number, which would then travel with them. So if you move from state to state, that number would travel with you. So what would this do? Um, it would do two things. One, it would... Um, eliminate a lot of the litigation over state ID laws, which would no longer be uh, necessary. Uh, and it would eliminate a lot of the litigation over voter registration because voter registration is going to be universal. So it would lower the amount of litigation, one thing it would do. Uh, but the other thing it would do is it would help to have a, a more efficient uh, process that voters can have confidence in. So we know that, you know, there's, you know, someone lives in New York in the summer and lives in Florida in the winter, that they're only voting in one place because that number would be unique to them. Now, this is, I think, one part of my proposal that people on the left are going to have less comfort with. Uh, you know, I, I understand that because they're worried that uh, this could be disenfranchising. The problem with voter ID, I think, is not the concept. Every state identifies voters somehow in California it's with signatures, which is not an exact science. As we know, people's signatures change over time, kind of subjective, sometimes figuring out if signatures match and all of that. Um, this is a more rational system. The problem with state voter IDs is that they are restrictive. So for example, in uh, Texas, you might be able to use a concealed weapons permit to identify yourself, but not a student ID. You know, this looks like it's um, being done potentially to shape who is in the electorate, but we wouldn't have that. The, 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 U, the US government or states would have the obligation to identify voters, to get the, track down those papers and not make you have to show those papers. And you would never have to provide an ID at the polling place. You, there would be a database where you could be identified. We could include in that people's photographs, which could be pulled up uh, in electronic poll books. Uh, we could include if people want to their um, thumbprint or their uh, retinal scan. I mean, there's lots of ways that we could identify voters. I mean, we would obviously have to have um, religious exemptions for people who don't want to be photographed. There are ways of dealing with this. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if uh, everyone didn't have to spend all their time trying to register voters and litigating over registration rules? Everyone's registered, and then you can fight over who should people vote for. I mean, that's really what the election should be about, not about the hurdles. If we have a system where all eligible voters, but only eligible voters can easily vote, then we can get to the main event, actual voting. So it sounds to me like you're uh, describing the promised land. I'm very excited by all that. <laughs> how, how do we get there? In, in, in particular, is this, would you have a federal voter uh, registration database? Do you require every state to issue these numbers? How mechanically, how would you implement this? Right. So it says that uh, this, um, the amend, proposed amendment says that states are responsible for registration, but they can, like with Obamacare exchanges, they can deputize. If they don't want to do it, they can just, the federal government then has to step in and do it. And you can imagine some states saying they don't want to do it. Maybe, you know, maybe they don't want to be a part of this system. The 
federal government would be responsible for coming up with numbers and they would be responsible for numbers that would identify voters and they would be responsible for working with states to assign numbers as people are identified and so you know uh new york comes in and says we've got you know these three million people that we have verified are eligible to vote all right we'll come up with three million numbers so you give everyone who's currently on the voter rolls just hypothetically a, a, a unique number right then then don't you still have to register the new voters as right. they come in? Right. So, uh, so the state's going to have to proactively go out and find those voters. You know, we conduct a census. Um, and if some, I should say, if somebody doesn't want to be registered, the, we're not forcing anyone to be registered to vote. But if they are uh, eligible to vote, uh, we're going to have. This is going to be a one-time, very massive effort to get everyone who is eligible on the rolls. And it's going to take, for some people, it's going to take a few years because you're going to have to track down, not everybody has a birth certificate. You know, you got to kind of identify the voters, make sure they are eligible. But like longer term, this system would then be rational. And once we have this database as a person, you know, I imagine voter registration people in each state working with high schools. As you graduate, then... Uh, you know, we're going to make sure you're assigned your number and you've, we've got all your documentation. So you're now set for life. That would be, uh, you know, how this system works. I mean, as someone, as I'm sure you have, went through the real ID requirement that the federal government imposed on states for driver's licenses, uh, turning up with everything I thought I needed to have and discovering that I didn't bring my passport or something else, uh, it was a complicated process to to get them to recognize that I was who I am and issue me my driver's license. Um, so you would want some way to streamline that for for voters. Absolutely, and um, you know the the question is: Is there a lot of uh, impersonation fraud? Are there a lot of non citizens that are trying to register? You know that would determine how. Um, rigorous the system has to be. And it turns well, out- Well, that, of course, is a partisan dispute, right? Right, right. So states would have uh, some uh, ability to um, enact their registration rules uh, in order to uh, verify people's identity, but they would have to do it with a thumb on the scale favoring voters. And they, they couldn't use this as a means of um, disenfranchisement. And one of the things the amendment does is it essentially confers standing on any voter. So there's not, you're not going to have a fight over uh, you know, uh, whether a voter can come in and basically put the state to the test to prove that what it's doing is actually required mm -hmm. to satisfy a really important state interest. Um, is it really necessary to require people to go through these hoops? Now, there's going to be a transition period. There'll be a lot of litigation over the scope of the new amendment during this transition period. But I think you know, ultimately, as we, um, you know, get through a couple of election cycles, this, I think, would be, uh, we would have much less litigation, and states would be less likely to try to pass laws like North Dakota did, requiring the residential address. There'd be, there'd be no state interest in doing it anymore. So all of those restrictive laws, or most of them, would, would be gone. You still might have a law that says you can't give water to people online to vote, then you're going to have to go in and challenge that and say, what is the real reason for this? Uh, is, are, are, is there a lot of vote buying going on with, you know, bottles of um, Aquafina? You know, and the states would quickly have to abandon those attempts. Mm -hmm. um, I, part of the text, as you noted, that's in the appendix of the book, uh, uh, talks about voters having a fair opportunity to participate in the political process. Do you see that as um, potentially a, a way, if, if that was the Constitution, for groups like CLC to argue that the unequal spending in elections and the special interest spending uh, that uh, drowns out everything else uh, hinders that, that opportunity? to participate in, in elections. So it doesn't have campaign finance implications. Right. And I I, I bracket those concerns. And I, I at least the if, if it's the intent of the drafter me, I was thinking, 
I dealt with that in my book, Plutocrats United. I think there's an argument for a constitutional amendment. Uh, it, you would have to be drafted in a very careful way. I wasn't intending that. That language about opportunity is really one more about um, the parroting the language of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, minority voters having less opportunity to participate in the process and to elect representatives of their choice. There's also language about uh, voters uh, not having overly burdensome uh, restrictions on voting. And, you know, that's where uh, challenges to things like the residential address can come in. Another example I give in the book is um, if people face long lines to vote, we can go back to the, the Bauer Ginsburg Commission that was at the end of the Obama uh, years where they said people on election day shouldn't have to wait more than 30 minutes to vote. That should be the baseline. So if there's a pattern in a city or, you know, some area where people are, have really long lines, they would have a basis to sue. But, uh, you know, I don't attack every problem with our democracy. I don't deal with partisan gerrymandering. I don't deal with campaign finance issues. I say nothing about ranked choice voting or alternative voting system. This is enough. This is a lot. But it's, you know, this is not going to solve every problem in our democracy, but I think it would make things a lot better, especially when it comes to the just the uncertainty and anxiety that we have every election season. I know people are feeling it because I get emails every day already from people who are worried about whether we're going to have a free and fair election in uh, 2024. As you know, there are groups out there focusing on other reforms, and the one that you just referenced would be a constitutional amendment to say that government may uh, regulate the amount of spending in elections. Um, it seems to me likely that if your amendment is being pushed along, that a group like that is going to say, well, that's perfectly complementary to our goals, and we should combine the two amendments. So you have a right to vote and a right for government to regulate spending in elections. Um, how is that a good thing to have a bigger amendment or a bad thing? Well, I, you know, although I'm in the ivory tower, as you said, I do have a foot in the real world. I see this as a as a kind of uh, I don't placeholder is not the right word, but I guess an organizing hub around voting rights. So rather than different people doing all different kinds of things. It would be, let's put our effort concerted into this one thing. And I think it will be up to the, I'm not a political activist. It will be up to the leaders of this voting movement to be able to decide what would be in there. Uh, just like, uh, do you want to include the electoral college uh, reform in there or not? Uh, if you go back and look at the history of attempts to have a, an affirmative right to vote in the constitution, the first real attempt was when uh, Congress was considering the 15th Amendment. That's the one that comes after the Civil War that bars race discrimination in voting. It was rejected. You know, they didn't want um, poor people voting. They didn't want the Irish or the Chinese immigrants that were coming in. At the time. They didn't want them voting. There was not support for universal registration of uh, universal uh, voting. Then uh, you fast forward to around 1959, 1960. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights proposed uh, a constitutional amendment that would uh, guarantee this. What happened there was that um, you got a lot of election reform in the 1960s. You got the 23rd Amendment, which gave um, presidential voting rights to D.C. The 24th Amendment abolished poll taxes. By 1971, you get the 26th Amendment on um, voting for 18 to 20 year olds. You get the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. So in the 60s, it was not seen as necessary. Then the movement starts up again in 2000. After the 2000 election, you have um, Jesse Jackson Jr. and the group Fair Vote. Uh, more recently, you have the Advancement Project and Demos uh, that are, are advancing this. And Demos, they have a proposed amendment that looks more like what you're describing. It's kind of a grab bag. It's more like the For the People Act, like let's reform everything we think is wrong with elections and it includes partisan gerrymandering, campaign finance reform. Some of the others like the Fair Vote Project and the Advancement Project were much more geared on voting itself. Uh, you know, anytime you expand an amendment, you run the risk of losing allies. And so, you know, I'd like to see, and I should say that one other benefit, I talked about the benefit of organizing within states over voting rights. So one other benefit is that if you start seeing resistance to the amendment by the courts, by 
um, uh, by uh, Republicans in state legislatures, well, then this helps to clarify what the stakes are. Like, what are the fights that we're having over our elections? Are, is it, and I talk about this a lot in the book, what is the purpose of voting? Is it about dividing power among political equals? Or is it more about choosing the best candidate? Because if it's about choosing the best candidate, then that becomes more of a basis to limit voting, maybe to people who can read and write in English or people who are property owners. I mean, we've had all kinds of discrimination in voting throughout American history. And I think that if, the, if we actually had a national discussion about what voting is for, more people would embrace this idea that we are all equals and we should have equal voting power. And so having that conversation is something worth doing, even if it's not in the short term going to lead to a constitutional amendment. So as we've noted, there are all these groups with their own uh, proposals. Uh, you've mentioned some of the groups that put together an omnibus bill. Um, what's the best argument for saying that everyone ought to get behind this amendment and put their resources here, ensuring a right to vote, uh, rather than the things they're already focusing on. But there's a limited amount of resources out there. Um, how do you convince them that this is at least the, the first one that it accomplishes more nationwide uh, than some of the others? Yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the, the issue today is that people are focused on the short term, justifiably so. So you think about those voters in North Dakota who couldn't vote because of this restrictive rule, then, you know, what is the, um, you know, of course you've got to deal with that. But I think we've lost our imagination about how things could be better in part because we don't amend the constitution anymore. Like there are spurts, there are periods of time in US history when you get a lot of amendments. You know, the progressive area you get amendments. In the 1960s, you got a lot of amendments. You know, we're so polarized that we're thinking small when actually we should be thinking big. And so mm -hmm. this is a political argument. You know, people have to decide what it is that they want to rally behind. So I saw just today, just before we came on, that there's now a, a uh, renewed proposal, the reintroduction in the Senate of the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act. I wholly support that. Um, we know it's going to go nowhere in this current uh, Congress. It's not going to be brought up, even if it, uh, you know, comes out of committee and votes in the Senate. It, it's now going to be subject to a filibuster. It's not going to be brought up in the House. So we can keep doing that, or we could try and think like, how can we have a broader national conversation about voting rights? And um, I'm not wedded to the language of my amendment. And I think, as I said. This is really going to be up to the people who are uh, going to be political organizers, not me. So mine is the opening bid, and people will have to um, uh, craft this in a way that they think is appropriate. And just those very discussions, what should be in, what should be out, I think is useful for our democracy. I think we have some questions from the uh, audience that has been hearing this conversation. So let's see if we can pop up uh, one or two. So. Woodrow Campbell says, can you imagine an interstate compact between some red and blue states that would have a similar effect in those states as your proposed amendment, i.e. Um, not actually amending the Constitution, climbing that hill in the House, the Senate, and the legislatures, but having some, some big states on both sides saying we're going to give the right to vote? Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's possible. Um... You know, would California make a deal with Texas? Uh, hard to imagine it today, given how there's so much sparring uh, between the states. I guess it could happen. I should point out that uh, the biggest proposal for an interstate compact has to do with our end run around the Electoral College. This is the so-called uh, National Popular Vote Plan. Uh, even though I support and I have a, I think I have a two page long footnote for anyone who really wants to go down the rabbit hole. Um, two page long footnotes explaining why, even though I would abolish the Electoral College, I don't like the idea of an interstate compact to get around the popular vote. 
Um, and the reason is that the interstate compact for the popular vote, as it's currently written, would say that if you are a, um, uh, a state that's in the compact pledging to uh, have your state's electors go for whoever wins the national popular vote, can't, you can't pull out within six months of the election. Well, I think the current Supreme Court would say, of course you can. The states have plenary power over the manner of choosing their electors. And we'd have a lot of uncertainty. So imagine California, very anti-Trump, looks like Trump's going to win. California says, you know what, we're pulling out of the compact. We don't want to go that way. So, you know, I, I'm not sure that... Um, uh, or, or, they pull out, or they pull out after the election because uh, they were stuck voting. They, they should be stuck uh, certifying the electors for the candidate they don't like. And right. so they say, oh, well, we're not we're not going to do it. Sue us. Yeah, right. So where that leaves us. Yeah. So so what I worry about with interstate compacts is that, you know, in addition to it not being a national solution, um, it can create some election chaos. And so that is not necessarily going to be the way to go, I think. Okay. All right. Let's see if we've got another question. Here we go. Given how difficult it is to get an amendment proposed and ratified, do you think a convention of states, now that's an interesting subject we should talk about, could somehow run away and claim to have amended the Constitution without ratification? Well, so you should talk about how the convention of states works first, and then we could get there. So, I mean, there's two things going on here, right? One is, um, okay, how do we amend the Constitution? And the way we amend the Constitution, uh, uh, the way it's always been amended is by Congress passing an amendment by a two thirds vote and then ratification by three quarters of the states. Which is provided for as one of the ways in the Constitution. Right. The other way to amend the Constitution is you can have what's called an Article five constitutional convention. The Constitution is very um, uh, lacking in detail as to how this is going to happen. But within states, states could uh, come together uh, and um, propose constitutional amendments. This would bypass Congress. This would be kind of a, a, a popular way of coming up with amendments. And then those amendments would still have to be ratified by three quarters of the states. And there's now a movement to try to do this. Uh, this, you know, uh, uh, is something that is being proposed much more on the right than on the left. Uh, you know, maybe you're going to have a national ban on abortion or you're going to further strengthen gun rights. And so some people on the left are very worried about this kind of convention. I think I'm a little less worried about this kind of convention because you still need to get ratification of three quarters of the states and that, that's gonna be very hard to do. Um, but I think this question is aimed at something else, which is like, uh, just like we had the Articles of Confederation uh, before we had our current constitution and we kind of started over, you know, maybe we just you know, start the whole thing over and I think that that is something that is very unlikely to happen uh, in the United States as an alternative path to, um, you know, getting getting change in our country. Uh, the the you know, I would rank that as third of three by far. Well, as you know, I mean, there are two things here. One, the uh, the original constitutional convention sort of took this model, which is the states sent. Uh, delegates to Philadelphia to talk about amendments to the Articles of Confederation, and they decided, right, we're going to come up with amendments that totally replace the Articles of Confederation, uh, and then we are going to say the states have to ratify it. So in, that's presumably the model the founders were thinking of when they wrote Article 5, that you could do it again. States would send people, you would have to get it ratified. Um, and that goes to these questions of can you have limits on what the convention can do? Uh, Philadelphia went beyond what I think most states thought was going to happen. Can you, is there any legal way to limit it and say you can only consider the uh, amendment that gives people voting rights? Um, yes, right. So I think that, you know, these are unanswered and in some ways unanswerable questions until someone tries. Uh, but there is, you know, there's a lot of trepidation about this. So I bracket those concerns in the book and say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this through the normal Congress proposes. And I'm hoping that down the line, I'll get some congressional 
uh, interest in this in my proposal. Um, but there's this whole other area uh, because it's not just about voting rights that we haven't amended the Constitution. It's about everything. Maybe it's time. But uh, in our polarized society, there's a lot of distrust and people are not. They're perfectly fine to propose their own amendments, but they don't really want to, you know, open this up for who knows what. OK, let's see. I think we have another question. Um, these are interesting ideas, but what can common voters do to bring it about? I'm looking for ideas beyond donating money to a group to push it. How do we lobby our reps um, and what, what do we say to them? Yeah, well, I like the use of an emoji in the question. So uh, this is uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, what, what kind of political action are we talking about? Uh, so I would say that, yes, you can start with your state representatives. Every state has a process by which their state constitutions can be amended. And every state uh, has a process by which uh, legislatures can seek to amend the constitution. So there are already lots of voting groups. Uh, you know, every, every state has a League of Women Voters. Every state has different uh, voting rights groups. They can start thinking today about do we want to think bigger rather than just deal with one issue? And even in states where people think that voting rights are strong, why not amend the Constitution to provide an example to others as to what can be done to make uh, voting better? And so because our elections are so decentralized and because things can start small on the local level, think city council, think, uh, think uh, you know, counties, think states. So that gives you a range of local things we could do. Uh, I think we have time for one more quick question, if we've got it. Let's see. There we are. What about revising the electoral college system to only give states the number of electors equal to the number of House representatives? That would remove the bias. Of course, that would require a constitutional amendment in itself. Right, it would. And if you're already going to you know, go halfway towards eliminating the electoral college, you might as well uh, junk the whole thing. Um, it, it's not just the two senators that skews the electoral college. You know, it's also the, uh, you know, we don't exactly divide up the number, the 435 members of Congress based on population. Um, but, uh, you know, that would be a marginal improvement. But, you know, people have pointed out to me that uh, Democrats have won the popular vote in seven out of the last eight elections. So, you know, get going, going to the popular vote would help Democrats. This is not necessarily true because these elections were run on an electoral college system. So it doesn't matter if you run up the popular vote total. Imagine if we had a popular vote system, you'd have Donald Trump spending time in Texas and Florida trying to get more votes out, even in New York, uh, California. California has more Trump voters than anywhere. You know, it would bring these campaigns to places where the people are. So I think, you know, there's a lot of benefit that would come from uh, having a popular vote. And it would also make it harder to mess with elections within each state because the margins would be, even in a close election, uh, with 160 million people voting would be in the, uh, you know, in the hundreds of thousands or millions of voters. Um, so we're almost out of time on this conversation, unfortunately, but I want to give you a, a chance for a last word. Um, once people have bought your book and read your book, uh, are there other resources that you tell them they should go take a look at uh, to understand the issue and, and uh, focus on voting rights? Well, you know, I would say that uh, people should start by reading the Constitution. I mean, just look in the Constitution, search for the word vote in the Constitution. You're not going to find it in very many places. Uh, the National Constitution Center has this nice annotated Constitution that is very helpful. Um, I would also say go to the Campaign Legal Center's website and look under litigation. Just look at what your docket is full of right now, and that will give you a sense of what, you know, what we're facing uh, as a country every election season. Uh, your work never ends, Trevor. Unfortunately, at the moment, that's right, although I like the idea that uh, your uh, book will make it easier. So, well, uh, Professor Rick Hassan, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. Uh, and talking about your new book, A Real Right to Vote, How a Constitutional Amendment Can Safeguard American Democracy. Uh, I, I know you're uh, having a chance to talk about this with a range of audiences, and we're really delighted you were on 
campaign legal conversations with us today uh, to have this really uh, stimulating, interesting conversation. And uh, uh, I, I think I've learned from it and I'll bet our audience has as well. So that thank you for all you do in this whole field and particularly for this new book. And thank you not only for hosting this, but for all the work you and the team at the Campaign Legal Center does for our democracy. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.